Hello, readers. Franz de Waal is a renowned primatologist and best-selling author. His newest book is titled Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. Franz, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So what was your goal with this book? Oh, my goal was to um, eliminate the biological side of the gender equation and also to... Um, to explain that things are not as simple. The comparison with the primates, people always think that with the other primates, we see biology, we see instinct. Um, it's not that simple. They have genders too. And the discussion of culture versus biology applies to them too. And so uh, I wanted to also uh, make the discussion a bit more complex than it has been, I think. And why did you focus mostly on chimps and bonobos? Well, those are our two closest relatives. So, so of all the primates, there are 200 species. Uh, the apes are the closest. We are apes. We are large tailless primates, which makes us apes. And so uh, chimps and bonobos are the closest that we have. And interestingly enough, they are very different characters. And so uh, people are used, of course, to the comparison with um, with chimpanzees, uh, and, and, and science has always sort of marginalized the bonobos as if they are not so important, but they are equally important in my view, and, and they give a very different picture because bonobo society is a very different kind of society. Chapter one is Toys Are Us, and the concept here is that males and females, both humans and primates, are actually drawn to specific types of toys and to uh, specific types of play styles. When looking at gendered play, Franz, do primates tend to make sex-neutral choices with their toys? No, no. The, the play behavior of the two sexes is very different uh, and, and is, is similar in the other primates as it is in humans. So first of all, the females are fascinated by babies, by infants. So as soon as the mother is a newborn, uh, she will be surrounded by young females who hang around and want to touch the baby and want to hold it. And if they're older, the mother will let them babysit the babies when they have a bit more experience. In the wild, we also know that um, chimpanzees, for example, they, they pick up wooden logs or rocks and carry them like an infant on their back, on their belly. So, so they make a sort of dolls out of them. And the females do that a lot more than the males. Uh, if you give dolls to primates in captivity, like if you give a, a teddy bear to the chimpanzees, um, the females will pick it up and the females will take care of it and carry it around and so on. The males, they may take it apart. They, they're, they're sort of interested in the inside. I think they're more technically interested in it. And so uh, the females have this enormous interest in, in infants from a very young age and in dolls also. The males, the young males, they like the roughhouse. They like to wrestle in mock fights and run around and beat each other up. And uh, all the male primates do that. All the human studies on children show that boys do it more than girls. And so those two play styles, so to speak, seem to be quite different. That doesn't mean that there are no individuals who cross over, so to speak, that sometimes females like to wrestle or sometimes males like to hold a baby. Um, of course, these exceptions happen too, but on average, I would say there's an enormous difference in play style. I understand the evolutionary rationale for why girls might be more drawn to the dolls than boys, but why are boys more rambunctious evolutionarily when it uh, comes to play? Well, I think that it's a preparation. In both cases, it's a preparation for adult life. Uh, and and the, the boys, the, the males, the young males, they will later have more uh, competitive, uh, confrontational interactions. So one reason is that they learn skills of how to fight. Another important reason is that they learn how to control their strengths, their physical strengths. Uh, that's a very important lesson that they draw from all that play fighting because they often play with partners who, is, who are either a lot stronger than themselves or a lot weaker than themselves. And they need to learn how to control their physical strength. So for example, a male gorilla who is so enormously strong, 
uh, with, with his uh, knuckles on a baby, he could just, with a little pressure, he could kill the baby. But you know, male gorillas, they do play with infant gorillas. They do play with them. So, so they have learned all the inhibitions that are necessary for a strong animal like that. So, th so that's another reason why that's an important, uh, the play behavior of the males is very important. And, and young males also have a higher activity level. Um, we know that also from human studies. That in human studies, they put some sort of machine on the children that measures uh, how many steps you take and how fast and so on, an accelerator or something it's called. And if you put that on children, you find that boys are more active, physically more active than girls. And that's the same is true in the other primates. You see the males run around a lot more than the females do. Do stereotypical gender colors like blue and pink make a difference when it comes to boys and girls or male and female primates selecting toys? No, I, th I think on the primates, I've never seen any evidence for that. In children, we know that that's probably a culturally induced difference because uh, in the early years, in the first two years or so of life, there is no preference in children uh, un unless maybe they are instructed to prefer one or the other, but there is no clear preference. Meaning that if, if, the, if that comes up only later, uh, it must be uh, induced. And so the, I, I think these pink and blue color things, that's a completely cultural construct. Interesting that at the start of the 1900s, those were actually flipped, where boys were more associated with pink and girls with blue. But my how things changed. Chapter two is titled Gender. Gender, surprisingly, was introduced as a label by a sexologist in 1955. Before then, it was really only used for grammatical purposes, though a distinction was made at that time between gender and biological sex. Those two things have become erroneously synonymous over time. What is the difference between gender and biological sex? Well, officially, the difference is that gender relates more to culture, to your expression of how you express your, your masculinity or femininity. And sex is more the biological side. So sex is used more for a difference in the genitals, in the chromosomes, in the hormones. That's usually how we divide it. And the sexologist who introduced the term uh, gender, John Money was his name, uh, was also the founder of the first gender clinic in 1965 in St. John, Johns Hopkins University. And um, because he had noticed that not all individuals uh, identify themselves with the sex that they're born with. And so he, he knew that there were all sorts of negative labels for that kind of um, children. Uh, they were um, weird or abnormal or queer. Or that. There were all sorts of negative labels and he didn't like that at all. He said, I'm gonna introduce the term gender for this. Uh, the term gender relates to the cultural expression of your uh, sex. And um, so, so he, he introduced that term. And then later, unfortunately, in English, we have started to confuse the two. And I think that's because English is a language that has only one word, sex, for having sex and having a sex or being of a certain sex. And uh, I think the, that was confusing. And, and so the, the, the term gender sort of filled the gap. And now people use the word gender uh, also for, you know, they will say, what, what is the gender of your dog? Which I'm not sure is the right way to use the word because I'm not sure that the dog has a cultural expression of its sex, for example. So, so um, now we are in a situation where people get confused. What is gender? What is sex? But it used to be pretty clear, I would say. We're in an era where over the last decade, we've seen examples of parents raising their children genderless. Is ridding a child of his or her gender a constructive way of battling gender-based inequality? Well, I, I think it's unfortunate that of the term gender inequality, we have started to focus on the gender side and, and said, well, maybe we need to eliminate genders or raise children gender neutral. That will solve the issue. I think in the terms gender inequality, the problem is the inequality. It's not the gender. 
I, I think um, the inequality and the injustice is clear, and and I'm I'm a big proponent of that we need more equality between the sexes and between the genders. Um, but I'm not sure that, that that needs to be achieved by gender neutral upbringing or denying that gender even exists or denying that biological differences are important. I think that focuses on the wrong side of the problem. I was surprised to learn in this book that some primate females more strongly resemble males with their actions. Is this recognized by other primates in some way, shape or form, Franz? Yeah, we had a female, for example, Donna, a chimpanzee female who acted more like a male and from very young, I've known her since she was three years old, so baby basically, from very young she was more male-like in her behavior and then later she grew into an individual who looked like a male from a distance, she looked like a male and she acted like a male and she hung out with the males and, and if I could have asked her her, her identity, who knows what she might have said. She might have said that she feels like she is a male. I, I don't know that. But uh, yeah, that kind of individuals occur also in the males. You may find individuals who, who are big and strong, and, but they don't want to be the alpha male. They don't play the macho games. They, they don't get involved in confrontations so much. And so, yeah, you have all that variability. It's interesting, we biologists, we are used to variability, very used to. So, so you, you walk into a forest uh, and you see two trees of the same species and they're gonna be very different. And we, we're used to variability, but society, human society for some reason is not so happy with variability. And so human society doesn't always accept it uh, and, and wants people to, to fit in certain pigeonholes uh, and so with, with gender, clearly, uh, the way gender is defined as, as a cultural expression, um, there's, there's, there's a whole range from masculinity to femininity and everything in between. And that range doesn't necessarily correspond. It only roughly corresponds with the biology side. So, so it doesn't need to. And there are exceptions to that. And, and I think that's, that's fascinating. And I think in the other primates, we find these exceptions too, even though science is not really focusing on that. So the scientists, maybe a bit like society, the scientists prefer typical behavior and they talk about the typical male and the typical female, but there's a lot of atypical behavior as well. Chapter three is six boys, a title that pays ode to your family. You were one of six brothers with your father and your poor mother having seven males to deal with in the household. Obviously, it's commonly thought that females are more emotional creatures than males are. How different are males and females emotionally in the primate world? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of saying that women are more emotional than men or girls are more emotional than boys. Um, I think all humans have tons of emotions and and we are guided by our emotions. Our emotions steer our behavior more, I would say, than our rationality. But you know, that's a sort of claim that um, male philosophers have made through the ages is that um, men are smarter, they're more intellectual, less emotional. Um, and, 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 and that's why, why men need to be boss in the society. That's sort of a justification for the inequality. And um, there is really not much evidence in, uh, if you look at psychological studies, that men are more, uh, more or less emotional than, than women. There, there is some evidence for a different expression, is that uh, the emotions that men are allowed to express in society are different. For example, anger. Men can express anger better than women. If women get angry, that doesn't look good. Uh, if men get angry, we sort of respect them for that. And, and the opposite, if, if men get empathic or sad or um, uh, cry, um, that's not very well accepted. And, and in women, that's more accepted. And so, yeah, the expression of the emotions is regulated differently in the society. But I'm not sure that the emotions themselves deep down are very different between the two. I always have to think in that case of... Um, because I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, of Dutch men who, who basically never express emotions. 
of Dutch men watching a, a football game of the Dutch team, well, I can tell you they are hugely emotional at that moment. So that's a moment that they are allowed to express a ton of emotions, sad or happy or whatever it is. Uh, but under other circumstances, they keep them under wraps, basically. Chapter four is the wrong metaphor. What exactly is this metaphor involving a baboon experiment from a century ago? And why is it wrong? Well, that was so unfortunate is that um, a century ago at the London Zoo, they put a whole bunch of baboons together, a hundred of them. Uh, Hamadryas baboons, which are, you know, the males are twice the size of females and the males have canines like this, enormous canine teeth. And so obviously they are dominant over the females and they uh, keep the females around them. So each male has maybe five or six females around him. And of course, offspring also. That's their society. But baboons are monkeys, they're not apes, so they're not so closely related to us. And um, what the zoo did was throw um, like, like 95 males together with five females or something like that. So it was completely the wrong ratio. And it became a bloodbath. These, these baboons didn't know each other. So it became a bloodbath. And the scientist who was in charge of that whole experiment, uh, Solid Zuckerman, he popularized the idea. And he popularized the idea that primate society is basically a, a bunch of males fighting over females. And the males are dominate the females and they kill each other over the females and so on. So he described it that way. And then popularizers picked up the, the data, so to speak. And so for a century, we heard that that's how primate society is organized very dominant males, very violent, and the females have basically no role at all. So um, it's very unfortunate, uh, and I think it's very misguided. And even in baboons, it doesn't work this way. So we know now from all the baboon studies that what went wrong at the zoo, but that's baboons is a very different animal from the apes, uh, from where we are uh, as primates. And so I think it's very unfortunate that that became such an important study at the time. Chapter five, getting back to the primates at question is bonobo sisterhood. Bonobos show that male dominance is not predestined. What have you learned to confirm this idea over the last couple of decades, Franz? Yeah, so bonobos are really interesting because they, they are female dominated. You know, initially there was a lot of resistance when uh, bonobos first reported. I, I noticed, for example, in captivity that um, I don't know a single bonobo colony in captivity that is not led by a female. So, so female dominance is very well known at the zoos, but then people would say, well, that's maybe at the zoos, but we, we need to know how they are in the wild. Now we know from studies in the field that it also applies in the field. So um, initially this was not well accepted. And I must say the, the bonobo is, is a problematic species for the anthropologists because the anthropologists have for ages promoted this idea that humans got to where we are. We, we evolved and, and we took over the world by eliminating everybody else, by being violent and territorial and having warfare and so on. And so the, the bonobo doesn't fit that idea. Bonobo is a female-led society, not territorial. The, the groups may mingle sometimes, not violent, very erotic. And, and, and of course, some people have trouble talking about sex and eroticism. And so the, the anthropologists are embarrassed by the bonobo. They don't know what to do with them. But I think they're, they're extremely important. They're equally close to us as the chimpanzee. They're female dominated. And so we need to understand how that works and why it is there and how it relates to human society. I think one of the things that you can relate to human society very clearly is the female solidarity that you find in the bonobo because the females are dominant collectively, not individually. So collectively, the females dominate the males and have a sort of sisterhood. And, and that's, of course, something that we see in human society also. The, the Me Too movement is basically a sort of bonobo movement in the sense that uh, it's based on female solidarity and, and uh, females deciding not to, to accept certain behavior of males. And, and I think that's what bonobos do. And they do, they do that very well and they do it 
probably better than than our species. Yeah, I thought the same thing when reading through this chapter. Now, you just described bonobos as erotic. What stands out about the sex lives of bonobos? Well, bonobo females have a bigger clitoris than almost any primate. I think bigger than human humans also. Um, and, and that relates to pleasure. We, we know now from anatomical studies that the clitoris is not some sort of uh, superficial uh, appendage or something. No, the, the, the clitoris is full of nerve endings, as, as many as in the penis. And so the clitoris plays a role in pleasure. And I think the bonobo females are pleasure seekers. One, the other, the other is that the sex is also very important for them for the bonding between the females. So there's a lot of female-female sex going on in the bonobos to resolve issues between them, to greet each other and so on. And, 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 and these sexual interactions, people sometimes have a misconception. They're brief. So it's not like they're doing this the whole day. That's really not what bonobos are doing. They have these brief encounters of maybe 10 seconds, uh, maximum 20 seconds of sexual interaction between them. It's more like a greeting or um, a grooming or, but, but it is sexual and it involves the genitals. So that's what bonobos do and they, they resolve their issues social issues and competition with sexual activity uh, and females um, use that partly as a political, it's partly a political instrument because the females dominate the males that way. So the females are leading, they're also taking care of the kids. What the heck are bonobo males doing all day then? Well, they're hanging around uh, the females in the hope to get sex with them. <laughs> and uh, Sounds like they, humans. They <laughs> they groom as females, they, uh, they, we call them often, the bonobo males, we call them mama's boys, because they are very dependent on their mom. So, so they don't have, like the chimpanzee males have coalitions between them who support each other and friendships and stuff like that. So, so the chimp males are actually quite cooperative, a bit like human males, I would say. But the bonobo males, um, their position in the hierarchy among the males because the males have their own hierarchy and the females their own, that's in all primate societies. These males, their position depends on their mom. If their mother is high ranking, they can be high ranking. If she's low ranking, they will be low ranking. If their mother dies or gets sick because she's getting older, um, they lose their position very often. So, so they have an interest in keeping an eye on their mom and staying nearby because she's the one also who will help them if. She, if they ever get attacked by another male or they get attacked by a female, um, she will help them. Chapter six is sexual signals. What was your study that was ultimately titled Faces and Behinds? Yeah, that was a strange study that we did. We, we did a study on touch screen with chimpanzees. And so the chimpanzees touch on the computer screen and in, in that case, we were looking at, uh, can they tell males and females apart? Uh, humans are very good at that. We, we look at the face, you can crop out the hair and the makeup and everything, and you just have the face. We can, within a second, with almost 100% accuracy, say it's a man or a woman. We, we're very good at it. So, so the human face, I call it, it's a gender signal. Basically, the human face has taken that role. And I wanted to know if, if chimpanzees can do the same with chimpanzees, not with human faces. And so uh, in that study, we presented um, them with a behind, a picture of a behind, because the behinds of males and females are totally different. The, the females have this genital swelling, the males have none of that. And so you, when you see the behinds of chimpanzees, you see immediately if it's a male or a female. So we showed them the behind and then we showed them two portraits of, um, uh, and, and, and one portrait was then the face of the same chimp of which we showed the behind. So you, it's a matching to sample task. A, so, so they see a behind and then they see two faces. One face corresponds with the behind, the other one doesn't correspond with the behind. And uh, can they make that distinction? And, and they were capable, they, they were very good at it. Um, but only with chimps that they knew. So you see the behind and then you see two faces and they can pick out the right face that belongs to it, but only with chimps that they know, which means it is not some sort of color saying or uh, background saying, no, it is based on their knowledge of the whole individual. 
The same thing has, by the way, has been done with humans. Human, human males are better at it than females, meaning that males are more in tune with behinds than, uh, than females, uh, which is also true for uh, chimpanzees. Hmm. Uh, and so it has been done with humans. I don't know how this was done, with, whether this was naked behind, so I have no idea how this was done, but um, it has been done with humans as well. But anyway, we did that study on the chimps and everyone thought it was funny and I got the Ig Nobel uh, prize for it. Um, Ig Nobel is, is a sort of Nobel prize, but then uh, for fun, you know. Faces and butts, faces and butts. Uh, another experiment, one conducted in the 1930s found that swollen female chimps those who were in heat uh, or have much more leverage with regards to getting their way, showing that fertility neutralizes any perceived male dominance. Is that really the case throughout nature, Franz? Well, I don't know if that applies to all animals, um, but we know that in chimpanzees, the females, and this is also known from the field, that if a female is genitally swollen, which means that she's fertile, and which also means that the males are interested in her sexually, which is, which is not all the time, that's only certain periods of her life. At that moment, that female can get away with a lot of stuff that normally would not be possible. She can take the food out of the hands of males. She can take priority when there's food around. Um, no, the, the males are very uh, differential to a female like that. And uh, yes, that has been described. And also in that experiment has been described that the female gets benefits from that. Yeah. Chapter seven is the mating game. The point here, and I completely agree, is that females and female primates in particular are not necessarily passive participants in sexual selective. They are much more active with things. How has the female sex drive been exploited in pigeon racing of all things? Oh yeah, there's a, there was a pigeon racer in Belgium who, um, who got a million dollars for one pigeon, a champion pigeon, because you know, pigeon racing, there's money in there. I, I don't think in the US it's done that way, but certainly in Europe and China, it's done that way. So there's money in there. So there was a, a female pigeon who brought up a million dollars and he described how he gained how, how that female would win races. And he, what he would do is he would remove her from her ma mate. She, she had a, was a mated pair. She would remove her from the mate for just a couple of days before the race so that she would be in a hurry. That's how he said it. <laughs> she would be in a hurry to get back to her mate, to party with him. That's how he described it. And it's interesting because that has been done with males all the time. This is a traditional way of getting males motivated to race male pigeons, uh, remove them from the female and he will be more in a hurry to come back and things like that. So for males, this was completely accepted. And he said, he discovered that there was uh, to females it works the same way. And, and so that's, that's a bit of a comment on the, on the female sex drive. And the female sex drive has been always systematically underestimated. I think that's a Victorian legacy that we have in biology is that it always focused on the males want sex, the females accept sex. That's how it was looked at. Uh, and now we don't think that way anymore. And, and, and the first crack in that kind of thinking came from uh, bird studies. And so, so people look, when we got paternity testing, people looked at bird nests and they looked at the eggs in the nest and they would find that not all eggs are fertilized by the male of the pair. The, the extra pair copulation is going on and, and the scientists worried about that and wondered about that. And they said, are these females being raped or what is going on? Now we know from studies that, that the females are actively looking for partners outside uh, the monogamous couple. And, and so th these are the bird studies. And, and I would say for the primates also, female sexual activity is, is quite high. And uh, females are, are very entrepreneurial uh, sexually. So that whole idea of a passive female sexuality uh, is undermined by present studies on animals. And, and I would say on humans, the same thing. Is there an obvious difference in sex drive between male and female primates, even if it's not necessarily the overall drive or some of the links that they're willing to go to get it? 
Well, the only difference that I know in humans, for example, is that men masturbate more than women. And, and masturbation is sometimes taken as a sign of the sex drive because it's not constrained by you finding a partner or you, it, there's no risk of, of uh, transmitted diseases or pregnancy. And so uh, masturbation is often taken as a measure of sex drive. And human males do more of that than females and, and primate males do more of that than females. F female primates also masturbate, by the way. Uh, so in that regard, there is a difference. But you know, in terms of partner choice, the, 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 when, when psychologists ask people, uh, and that's why I'm not a big fan of questionnaire methods because I think people lie all the time. When they ask people, how many sexual partners do you have in the last five years, for example? Men have always more partners than women, plenty more, so sometimes five times more than women, which is illogical on, on a, let's say, on a university campus where this kind of research is done. It's not logical that men can have five times more uh, sexual partners than women. It's, uh, that's an impossibility. And so what they found is that if you press the women, for example, by telling them by hooking them up to a lie detector machine so that they think that they are on a lie detector machine, all of a sudden they have more partners. And which means that these, these women have not been completely open about how many sexual partners they have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important um, consideration is that all these questionnaire methods that the psychologists use, asking people about their sex life or what they eat or what they do, in, I, I'm not a big fan of it because I don't trust people enough. I'm so glad that I work with, uh, with animals who cannot fill out questionnaires and I just have to measure their behavior. Chapter eight is violence. There are numerous creatures in the animal kingdom that rape. Dolphins and penguins are the first two that come to mind for me. Do primate, uh, primates commit a form of sexual assault on one another? It's unusual. So in one of the apes, the orangutan, the younger males do that sometimes. And, and so the, the orangutan is always featured by primatologists to say that rape occurs in primates. But in chimps and bonobos, um, no. In bonobos, I would say it's totally absent because bonobo females are dominant over the males and so absolutely zero. I've never seen evidence for that. But forced copulation, as we call it, in chimpanzees is also extremely rare. It, so forced copulation is really not a, a typical primate pattern. Um, I think it's more common in the human species. Uh, in humans, we know one in six or one in 10. I don't know what the number is. One in six, I believe, women report uh, rape. And so in humans, it's more common. And I think it, it has partly to do with the way we have set up our nuclear families. We evolved nuclear families. And so we have families who live in different houses or different dwellings. And that creates a situation where a man can control a woman and um, where not everyone is present. Uh, because in a primate society, of course, if a male tries to force a female, everyone is present. And, and the situation with the orangutan, the reason that, that in the orangutan rapists may be more, norm, more, more common is because um, the females are on their own. The orangutan is, is a solitary, mostly solitary living uh, animal. And so the female travels on her own with her offspring and, and a male has no competition and no others around when he approaches her. So that's very different from chimps and bonobos. And I think the situation with humans also, we have created a society in which it is possible for men to control women in isolation. And that's maybe why rape is more common in our species. Even though rape is less common amongst primates, uh, primate males do play into the stereotype that males are more violent. Why is this? Well, the violence and the size of the males has more to do with male-male competition than with the females. The, the males may use it against a female, and that happens. Uh, but um, all the studies that we have indicate that the size of the males, for example, why gorilla males are twice the size of females, or why certain baboon males are so big, the size of, of males and the physical strengths 
has to do with male-male competition. The more intense the male-male competition, the more the size increases, the size difference between the sexes increases. So, so people should not think, because they sometimes think that, is that males are bigger and stronger in order to dominate the females. I don't think that's why it evolved. It evolved in order to compete with other males. And if you look at human violence, the statistics on homicides in humans, that's, uh, that's more, more common between men than between men and women, even though women suffer from that and, and there's, there's quite, quite a bit of violence by men against women, there's even more man to man. And, and, and that's, uh, for the biologists, that's logical because that's where um, th these aggressive tendencies started. Now, the, the violence of human man is always greater. There's, there's no society that I know of where it is not greater in men than in women. And I think in the primates, that's also the case is that there's more physical violence by males than by females. And if you look at the statistics, for example, that we have on chimpanzees in the field, um, that's very similar to human society. The, the, the distribution of violence is mostly male to male. It's often between groups. So, so not, not males of the same group, but of different groups. And, 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 and sometimes it's directed at females and sometimes it's directed at infants also. So infants may be killed and things like that. Hmm. Chapter nine is alpha females. How has the idea of the alpha male been misconstrued over time, Franz? Yeah, so the um, alpha male story, I gave a TED talk about that one time about how alpha males have been turned into bullies. When I first wrote about, uh, about it in chimpanzee politics, I used the term alpha male and it was picked up in Washington by the politicians. And, and if we now often speak of alpha males, I think that comes partly from my early studies on that. And, and in that literature, if, for example, the business literature on alpha males, it, it's always construed as like, you need to show that you're boss, you need to let everyone know who is boss here and you need to beat them over the head and make clear that you are in charge. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, simple, and, and distorted perspective on what an alpha male is, in my opinion, because a good alpha male, and I've, I've known many good alpha males in the primate world, um, breaks up fights, keeps the peace, protects the underdog, and can become extremely popular as a leader because he provides security and he unifies the group. And so I think alpha males have much more of a function, a positive function, than people realize because people think always it's a sort of dictator. Um, so, so I think that, that has been underestimated and it's very important to have a, a responsible alpha male in a group of primates because the young males come up, the adolescent males, and they're growing bigger and stronger than the females at that age. And they, they, they are out of control, so, so, so they're dangerous. They, they don't know what they're doing and they, they become overly aggressive. And it's very important to have some high ranking males present who uh, put a stop to that uh, and they can do so very effectively. This is also known, for example, I, I describe it for uh, elephants. It's, it's known that since we, we I'm, I mean the poachers, since they kill the biggest elephants with the biggest uh, tusks, the, the dominant males are often removed from populations. And, and as a result, the younger males become unruly. And then you have all these adolescent males going around attacking females and, or attacking the wildlife. There was one, one reserve where the, the, the young elephant bulls had killed a lot of rhinos. And the only solution, and that's what they implemented, the only solution was to bring in some big males who could put a stop to that. So I think high ranking males are important in a society and, and the good ones can bring peace and harmony. There are sometimes, as in human society, there are sometimes dictators who um, mess up things. And, and I've seen that also in primate groups. Hmm. Chapter 10 is keeping the peace. It takes a person about one second to detect someone else's biological sex. Evolutionarily, Franz, why is this? I think we humans, we, we have moved um, the, the gender signals to the face because we cover our bodies. 
in most societies we cover the not in all of them of course but we in most societies we cover our bodies and um, certainly our genital area and so a lot of the sexual signaling that happens in other primates where for example from behind you, you look at a chimp male or a chimp female you immediately see the difference uh, that's not so obvious in our species and i think we have moved sexual signals to the front and to the top because we are bipedally walking uh, species and that's why um, our faces are quite different for the genders uh, and that's also why people are so accurate and so quick to determine whether someone is a man or a woman uh, and so uh, that has to do with sexual signaling i think and we enhance it of course then culturally we add to it by makeup and lipstick and hairstyle and we we are beards and so we we have a capacity to enhance it even more than than just the face in terms of competition do primates resemble humans with how they are much more likely to want to compete with the same sex yeah i think that's true for all the all animals basically is that the the biggest competition is is within each sex so, so for example, bonobos, where the females dominate the males phys uh, collectively, uh, the, the males are most worried about their position among the males. It, it, that's not the biggest concern is whether they are dominant or subordinate to the females. It's what is their rank among the males and for females also. So what is their rank among the females? And, and this is true for all the animals, I think. In, in human society, sometimes people say that men are more hierarchical than women uh, and I, I know this is a common misconception in psychology is that women are not not so competitive and are not so hierarchical mm -hmm. as the as the man i have never seen good evidence for that uh, the the term pecking order uh, comes from hens not from roosters i think females have hierarchies females are competitive and in the human society, of course, also females have their own hierarchies and, and look up to certain women and, and not to other women. And so um, I think within the gender, there is a lot of competition, also a lot of bonding. It's interesting that, that combination, there's bonding and competition within each gender, and, and it leads to some sort of hierarchical structure. When, when experiments were done with humans, so, so you bring humans into a room and you, you let them discuss a difficult topic and, and, and the scientists look at who interrupts whom. That's how they determined uh, whether they had a, a rank order among them or not. And, and the one who interrupts is the more dominant individual. Uh, and, and they did that with same gender groups. If you do that with humans, um, the men form a hierarchy more quickly than the women, but the women always form one too. So, so, so men are a bit faster in it, uh, but there's not, otherwise there's not a big difference between them. Yeah, anybody who thinks women aren't as competitive as men, my seven-year-old daughter would like to have a word with you. And on the subject of competition amongst sexes with one another, there is a big topic of conversation going on in this world right now with trans women, that is biological males who identify as women, competing with biological females. Um, while I want to emphasize it is important to show these trans women as much love as we have to offer because they need all of our support, I don't know if it is proper or if it is a good solution to have trans women who have already gone through some form of puberty competing with biological females. How do you feel about this one, Franz? Yes, you know, I, I think it's a small problem compared to the problem of how we integrate trans people in, in, in society. Because how many of, of them are in competitive sports where this matters? But we basically can name these athletes. That's how few there are. So it's, it's maybe one in a thousand or one in 10,000 trans people who are in that situation. And I agree that the, the sports organizations need to come up with some sort of solution because we cannot deny the biology that is involved in this. We cannot do as if that doesn't exist. But it is compared to the acceptance of transgender people, it is a very minor problem. And I think we, we better focus. It's a sort of distraction. We better focus on all the 
boys and girls who want to play with, uh, who are transgender, who want to play with boys and want to play with girls uh, and, and how we get them accepted. I think that's the bigger problem. Generally speaking, you are a huge advocate for reconciliation after conflict, as am I. Why do men tend to get over conflict quicker than women? Yeah, I think uh, for, for the primates, we know this. For, for chimpanzees, for example, the males cycle much more easily through conflict and reconciliation than the females. Uh, for humans, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of data. I think we, we have more data, we have more knowledge about the conflict resolution strategies of the primates than of humans. And, and I don't know why the psychologists don't focus much on that, but we do have some evidence from uh, the business world that uh, business psychology, that women are more troubled by conflict uh, at their workplace than men. And, and they suffer more from competition and conflict than men do and men get over it more easily, so to speak. And, you know, I, since I'm from a family of six boys and I've always seen that, that conflict and uh, reconciliation, you know, uh, that, that cycle is, is very quick and very common uh, among boys. And in the chimpanzees also, the, the males are uh, much better at reconciling after fights than the females. Um, but I, I think basically I, I postulate two strategies. The female chimpanzees have a strategy of peacekeeping and the males of peacemaking. So the males have a conflict and then they reconcile. The females try to avoid conflict, stay away from your rivals, the ones that you are easily going to have conflict with, stay away from them and uh, suppress uh, the tendency to get into a fight. And, and that may be, uh, this is a speculation, I don't think we have a ton of data on that. There may be also what happens in humans is that women are better at suppressing conflict, avoiding conflict, let it not even arise because when it arises, it, it gets out of control and it's very hard to reconcile. Whereas men find it more easily to, to, to have a fight and then drink a beer after that, you know. Chapter 11 is nurturance. What story did Robert Goy relate to you that you shared at the start of this chapter and why does it matter? Yeah, Bob Goy was a um, uh, neuroendocrinologist. So, so he studied hormones and behavior in, in primates, mostly in primates. And um, he once asked me, he said, what happens if you, if you have a, a male and a female macaque in a cage and you, and you put in a, a baby monkey? And, and, and these are males and females who know babies, they know about babies, but it's not their baby. What happens? And um, he asked me that, and, and, and his answer was that um, the, the male will act as if the baby is not there. The, male, the baby may be making noises, and, but the male does as if it's not there. It's the female who in the end will pick up the baby, put it on her belly and calm it down. And um, the male does as if it's not there. And so you might conclude from that that, um, the male is not interested in infants. But he said, what happens if you have just a male in the cage and you put a baby in and then everything changes? The male may still be reluctant to touch the baby, but at some point he will pick it up and put it on his belly, same way that the female does and calm it down. And so he, his point was that the males are perfectly capable of doing this and they're even willing to do it, but not in the presence of a female because when there's a female, it's better that the female handles it. Uh, and so he, he, he was sort of hinting at a task division, but it's not the absence of caring tendencies in the males. And I found that very interesting as, as a story, because we now know from studies that, that the nurturing tendencies in males are, are plentiful. Males have that capacity. And, and it's an important point in connection with our current discussion in society. I noticed, for example, that conservative media sometimes make fun of paternity leaves. You know, men don't need paternity leaves, but not paternity leaves. Uh, on the assumption that caring for children is, is a women's job, it's not a man's job. And I think our species even has more male caretaking capacities than most because we evolved nuclear families. And so, I think the human male has plenty of um, potential in that regard. 
Chapter 12, Same Sex Sex. You ask whether we should be surprised that humans and other animals, including primates, regularly engage in sexual activities that can't possibly lead to reproduction. Does this surprise you, and why or why not? No, it, it doesn't surprise me because it, in, in all animals, we see some degree of homosexual activity in some more than others. The most famous case became, of course, the penguins at the Central Park Zoo, where two males raised a, a chick. Not, they could not produce a chick. <laughs> it was a, a fertilized egg that they got from the caretakers, uh, but they did uh, raise the chick. So, so yeah, um, homosexual sex and homosexual bonding is not unusual in the animal kingdom. In the primates, uh, it occurs quite a bit. And, and of course, in bonobos, I usually call bonobos bisexual because I, I don't think it matters much to them whether they have sex with same sex or different sex uh, individual. So, so it is a very common behavior. And the, the literature you know, of biologists, biologists have, delved into homosexual behavior and they always come with the same question like how could this possibly have evolved um, because it doesn't do anything for reproduction that's 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 the biology approach and i think that's a bit simplistic because it it make, makes a dichotomy between homosexual and heterosexual is like as if these are different individuals but many individuals do both and in human society also that that distinction between hetero and homosexual is more sharp in our language than it is maybe in real life. There's maybe many, for example, recently a study came out on human behavior, which said that heterosexual orientation is better be called mostly heterosexual in the sense that it's not a hundred percent. So, so I think we, we make this dichotomy as if these are different species almost, homosexual and heterosexual. And then we ask, how could this have evolved? Um, it's not that simple. And if we look at the genetics, there are now some studies of the genetics of homosexual behavior. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a mess because it's not clear that there are clear genes that produce this kind of behavior or that kind of behavior. And, and I would say um, that question, how could homosexual homosexuality evolve is not the right question. I, I think that there's a tendency to have sexual uh, relation with other, and, and that mixes probably with the same sex bonding, which is very strong in the human species. Women bond with women, men bond with men. That kind of bonding is quite common. I think if, if sexual, um, sexual drive, the sex drive, so to speak, combines with that kind of bonding tendencies, you may get homosexual behavior. And, and I don't think it needs a special uh, evolutionary explanation necessarily. Hmm. Franz De Waal is a renowned primatologist and best-selling author. His newest book is titled Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. You can get it now wherever books are sold. Franz, thank you so much for the time today and thank you for this important book. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day. Good day.